All right, now let's talk about chapter 16, Darwin and, and the process of evolution. So um, before Darwin came along, the general, generally accepted idea, or what you might call the dominant paradigm at that time, was that the Earth was relatively young, approximately 6,000 years old, and that basically all organisms had been specially created. Specially created. That is basically that God had made them as they are. And so essentially mice and rabbits and people and oak trees, everything had been here as it is, as they are now since the beginning of time 6,000 years ago. Um, so that was the generally accepted uh, notion at that time. And um, even among scientists, it was, was accepted because, again, that they didn't really know any better, you might say, or there was no nothing else for them to think of, really. Um, but it was... Uh, now, Darwin was not the first to think of the process of evolution, and that is the notion of species changing through time and populations changing through time. But as we'll see, he was the first to come up with a credible mechanism for how it happens. Um, that is what we know as the process of natural selection, okay, as opposed to artificial selection. Um, a little history on Darwin. He um, was uh, raised in a relatively wealthy family. His dad and his granddad were both doctors. Um, as he got to be an adolescent and a teenager and such, it was expected that he would follow in their footsteps. And indeed, he went off to college and studied medicine for a year, but it wasn't to his liking. And so he basically dropped out after that year. Um, the next thing he essentially, after much thought, decided to do, so again, he first tried to study medicine, but then he basically, you might say, went to seminary, and he was studying to become a pastor or a member of the clergy. Now, he thought that sounded like a pretty good thing to do. I mean, he was a religious person like just about everyone then, and um, at that time, um, there really were no professional ecologists, but pastors often uh, studied nature. And Darwin was definitely into that as a kid. He liked to go out in the woods and collect bugs and, and uh, rocks and all sorts of things. Um, and so he thought it would be a, an agreeable profession because it would give him time to, again, study nature and to contemplate nature. And, and the reason uh, a number of pastors did this is that at that time because, of course, they were trying to figure out uh, essentially what, did, what was God saying when God created all this stuff, if anything. Um, okay, so he completed those studies and was prepared to get assigned to a church somewhere, but as they say, fate intervened, and he uh, was hired onto a ship, the HMS Beagle, and he was hired to be the naturalist on the ship. This is a, His Royal Majesty, this is a British naval vessel, and they were going to go explore and map South America, and they often took someone on board whose job was to collect things, to collect plants and bugs and other types of animals and rocks and ship them back to England to be studied. So that was his job, and also um, because Darwin was of the upper classes, he was also supposed to be uh, a companion or guest of um, the captain of the ship. Um, on ships at this time, of course, sir, you had the crew, and they were of generally working lower classes, and then the, the, the captain of the ship was more of the upper class, and of course, he really didn't hang out with them, so it was always nice to have someone on board who was more educated and of your uh, social class, if you will. <clears throat> All right, so again, the, the Beagle's job was to go and explore and map the coast of South America. Um, altogether, you can see they were gone for 
just about five years. It was only originally supposed to be gone for a couple of years, but it uh, took a lot longer than they thought. Um, uh, the ship would drop Darwin and an assistant off at particular spots along the coast, and then Captain Fitzroy would continue going, and he had to go sort of back and forth and up and down the coast of South America to help create his map. So he would drop Darwin off and leave him for a week or two and go back and pick him up. And while he was on land, Darwin would explore, collect things, meet uh, the local people. Um, and so they circumnavigated the globe with a important stop in the Galapagos, where a lot of Darwin's important observations were made, as well as you can see New Zealand and Australia and um, parts of Africa as well. What were those observations that he made? Well, that there was an incredible amount of diversity out there. And uh, you may remember from that video we watched about Darwin. Uh, for example, he noticed out in the middle of the ocean when you would sort of take a scoop out the water, you would find plankton in the water. And some of it he thought was quite beautiful, and he wondered why it was out there in the middle of the ocean where no one could really see it and what its possible purpose was, and why would, why would God put this plankton out in the middle of the ocean um, if no one was there to see it or enjoy it? Um, because, of course, that's what things are there for, right, for people to enjoy and make use of. Um, so that was a curious thing. These are some beetles, and I believe these are ones that Darwin actually collected. And, of course, you can see they come in various sizes and shapes. And, and um, as has been noted, um, there is an incredible diversity of beetles on the globe. Amongst insects, they're the most diverse group. And amongst animals as well, they're the most diverse group. Um, another thing he noticed, and... Um, this is, uh, he, he didn't necessarily coin this term, but what you, this is what you can refer to as convergent evolution. And he noticed on these different South American, con I'm, I'm sorry, Southern Hemisphere continents, that on all of them, Australia, Africa, South America, there were these large flightless birds. So they had uh, sort of the same habit and lifestyle, if you would, if you would but they were, they were different species. Um, and he essentially described uh, what we now know as convergent evolution. That is, you can have different species with different origins, but yet when they live, you know, they live on different continents. But essentially, even though they're on different continents, they live in similar habitats. So their, basically, their phenotype converges to be very similar, large reduced wings so they don't fly, good runners, um, herbivores. And so this, this demonstrates, again, what we know is convergent evolution, species converging to look and act alike even though they don't have um, a common ancestor, if you will, that gave rise to their particular form. That is, their ancestors were quite different from each other, but yet they have converged to look alike. Um, also, when you look at areas, particularly islands, you'll find, of course, different species on the islands, but those species tend to be very similar to each other. So there's variation, but yet uh, not so much variation that you can't tell that they're closely related species. And so when you go to the different islands of the Galapagos, you find different kinds of tortoises. So they're all tortoises, but yet they have somewhat different adaptations to the island they live on. They have these sort of dome-shaped um, um, shells, and others have a saddle-shaped shell where towards their head there's this part that sticks up, which allows those tortoises to, to reach up much higher and eat particular kinds of food that these other kinds is not available on their island and they don't have to eat, so they did not evolve that particular shell shape. Um, also, with the finches that are on the island, um, again, they're all finches and somewhat similar, but yet they are also different, in particular for their feeding habit, which is determined or which shapes their beak. Some have very small, narrow beaks, and these are insect feeders. Some have 
very large, robust beaks, and these are ones that eat large seeds, others that eat smaller seeds, and then still others that feed on, on cactuses and such. Um, again, they have a, they're all finches, they have a common ancestor, but variation has developed because they've spread out to those different islands. This process of this spreading out and, and changing in different islands to be somewhat different is what's known as adaptive radiation. They radiate or spread out onto the different islands, adapt to the local conditions, and change accordingly. Fossils, uh, Darwin um, in his ex exploration of the land found lots of different fossils, particularly in South America, of these essentially ex extinct animals like glyptodonts and giant ground sloths, these things that existed in the past but don't exist now. Uh, they have ancestors nowadays that are sort of similar to them, like the armadillo, for example, is similar to a glyptodont, but the glyptodont is a lot bigger and isn't around anymore. And of course, there are sloths that live up in trees, and they're much smaller than these ground sloths. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, when you look at the fossil record, you find things in the past that you don't see now, and the things that exist now are not found in the fossil record in the past. Essentially, things have changed through time um, as we look at the fossil record. All right. So those were his own observations. Now, there were also things that he was reading, people he knew, people he talked to of his time that helped shape, shape his ideas as well. Um, like I said, the, the general notion back then was that the Earth was not very old, although 6,000 years may sound like a lot. Um, it really isn't when you look at the scale of the Earth and the universe and solar system at all. So there were some geologists at this time, um, Hutton a little earlier, but then Lyell was a contemporary of Darwin. And these folks were studying processes that shaped the Earth, uh, the surface of the Earth, um, things like volcanic activity, uh, plate tectonics, um, erosion. And they developed this idea that became known as uniformitarianism. And what uniformitarianism says is that the processes that shape the Earth happened in the past, they happen today, and they will continue to happen in the future, and they happen at uniform rates. That is, the movement of the plates doesn't really speed up or slow down. Erosion doesn't speed up or slow down. It happens at a sort of constant rate. Um, and... So these are relatively slow processes for the most part. And so when you look at a geological feature like the Grand Canyon, it was formed by the erosion of the river flowing through and eroding the rocks away. And as, as they figured out, it's a very slow process. And so it's going to take a long time for something like this to form. And essentially, uh, the 6,000 years that had been proposed was really not nearly long enough for these processes to shape the Earth's surface. And so they started arriving at figures of, you know, millions of years old, the old, millions of years old for the Earth. And so this essentially provided the time necessary in Darwin's um, ideas on evolution enough time for the process of evolution to occur, for these multitude of species to arise. As I said, Darwin was not, well, let's see, let's get back to Lamarck on the next video. Okay.